Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the stage, Greg Isles, Richard North Patterson, and Scott Turo, with your moderator, Linda Ferristein. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, I think it's, you would all agree, I'm sure, what a wonderful, wonderful couple of days this has been, a great festival. <laughs> to our founder, Jamie Kabler, just oh. brilliant job, brilliant job. <laughs> Shy as he is, brilliant job. Uh, this is a panel uh, called Crime Does Pay. We could spend a few hours amongst ourselves talking about whether that's true or not, but it's, it's catchy. Uh, I feel somewhat like, um, I was trying to find the right analogy, my husband who really does love me uh, and is a pretty modern guy said, well think of it like you're a rookie player with three Hall of Famers uh, that you're interviewing. And I was up half the night trying to think of something with a little more feminist twist. So for those of you who know your literary uh, history, there was a young woman, very young woman, named Mary Godwin, and she married uh, a very famous British poet named Percy Shelley. And on their honeymoon, when she was 18, they went to Italy where they spent time with Lord Byron uh, and another fellow named William Polydore. And one night around the fire with a lot of wine uh, uh, being consumed, the uh, four of them decided, and the uh, three men were very famous, very well-known writers, poets, um, and Polydor, the creator of the vampire story. Um, Mary, the bride, was 18, and the four of them made a bet, one of the most famous bets in literary history. They bet amongst themselves who could write the best horror story. And until the coming of Stephen King, most people regard Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as the best horror story ever written. So I'm not there yet, but I hope someday, <laughs> that's what I mean, someday to be in the league with these guys. <laughs> so I'm here with, uh, with three of the best. Uh, yesterday, some of you were fortunate enough uh, at the crack of dawn to hear Scott and Greg in a conversation on this stage with each other, a lot of nodding heads. You heard some great things which I will try not to cheat and steal from. But one of them... All, uh, all writers. All cheat writers and cheat and steal. We do that. <laughs> and Greg said of Scott something that I think is true of all three of these men, which is that they walk the line between literary fiction and genre fiction. Some people look down on genre fiction. Better than any writers on this planet since Jean, John Le Carré, who is another one of my favorites. So we're going to talk wide-ranging about a lot of, of the things these men have written about and think about. But I am going to start with the issue of genre because uh, we're not exactly all crime pays at the same time and in the same way, same category. So I'm going to start with my dear friend Rick Patterson, known as Richard North to many of you. Um, I would like you to talk uh, about your arc, about what you started to write um, Actually, Rick, Scott, and I are all lawyers first and then became writers. So Rick is not writing crime fiction. I love to be called a crime writer. He would shoot me if I said, here's, here's a crime novelist. So why don't you open this, Rick, with telling us what you do now and that your book Swamp Fever is in the bookstore down the road. Uh, well, I'm, I'm now uh, concluded after the election in 2016 that fiction is redundant. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm writing um, a weekly political column for the Boston Globe and a uh, bi-monthly uh, column longer for the Huffington Post, uh, trying to explain the inexplicable uh, uh, to uh, an audience which is bewildered as I am. Uh, but my career started uh, with being a lawyer, and I will say that whereas I resist the notion that that I or any of us are writing for crime fiction, uh, I do believe in the power of story. 
Uh, I think it's very important to, to that people want to turn the pages if they care what happens. Uh, and, you know, a, a good plot, a good narrative can carry a great deal. I mean, I've written about the Israeli-Palestinian problem. I've written about uh, abortion politics, lots of things. But in order to make people sit still for the amount of erudition that I presume to put in my books, I needed to have a narrative that, that, that people cared about. I needed to have characters that people cared about. I think we all really uh, up here try to do that. Uh, I know both you know, Scott and Greg and Linda are, are excellent at that. Um, so for me, whatever you call uh, a novel, a uh, story is important. I don't think it's embarrassing to, uh, to partake of traditional craft of fiction where you want people to turn the pages, where you want people to care about the ending, but I think people should care about the ending not only because the story's pretty good, but because the story is about people who are changed by events and who act upon each other on a way that's dramatic and interesting, uh, and about a subject matter which is important. So when I wrote Exile, for example, which is my novel of the Israeli-Palestinian problem, it, it, it proceeded um, uh, from the premise of a trial, but most of it was spent exploring the tragic history of these two people who seemed to be trapped like scorpions in a bottle, and we saw it again on television today, uh, in a tragedy um, for which one hopes there's a resolution, but I tried both to dramatize and explain what was going on. So, whereas I resist the notion that I'm writing crime fiction, I don't resist the notion at all that the elements of good crime fiction are, are, are story and character, and those have been very important to me, and I think important to most people when, as, as, as readers. Greg, would you talk uh, a bit about <coughs> your... Uh, <laughs> I don't your care journey. what they call me as long as they buy the book. <laughs> <honestly>. <laughs> uh, I've been, I've been called everything from the poster boy for Southern Gothic fiction to the William Faulkner for the Breaking Bad generation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be called the latter, but I don't really care. Um, mostly, though, the crime label doesn't bother me because I think I've written across many genres. I've written about everything from the Holocaust to childhood sexual abuse to civil rights murders. And uh, I'm writing about the nature of evil and the human response to it and why good people do bad things. And sin, for lack of a better word, the old verities. And crime novels tend to, I think, touch on that and express it best rather than hugely ambitious novels frequently do, you know. I'd rather read a John D. McDonald than John, Jonathan Franzen, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got to say. <laughs> well, I know you have more to say. We'll get back to that. Scott, would you talk about, uh, uh, for me, as I said this morning when I interviewed Scott for the first time, Presumed Innocent, his second book, was just a breakaway uh, legal thriller that, uh, for many of us, focused attention on that subgenre in the genre and uh, really brought so many people to write uh, almost an imitation of what Scott had done. And like Rick and like Greg, he takes on moral issues and legal issues and writes about people, the effect of events on them. Uh, but the arc has been since 97 when Presumed Innocent was, I'm sorry, 87 when Presumed Innocent was published. Time to, flies when time you're flies having fun. To uh. this year's Testimony, which is a brilliant book. Would you talk about your, uh, how you see your place in literature? Well, I, I, um, I, I alluded yesterday to sort of my, uh, late adolescent ambition to be the next James Joyce. And I went off to uh, the writing program at Stanford after college. And I was, I was really tormented in lots of different ways, and some of them were theoretical, uh, in the sense that uh, I, I admired uh, Joyce, for example, uh, and yet, um, well, I worked in the post office in Glencoe, Illinois, in the summers. And I came back uh, to the post office early one day, and one of the clerks took me down in the basement and explained that he was going to kick my white ass all over <laughs> Glencoe if I showed up early again, uh, because nobody wanted the postmaster to know that the job was being done that easily. So <laughs> I... Uh, the only air-conditioned building in Glencoe, Illinois in those days was the public library, and so I'd finished my freshman year in college, and I'd been taught that the 
greatest novel ever written was Ulysses and uh, by Joyce. And so I decided I would read Ulysses, being paid $2.52 $2 an hour by the taxpayers of the United States. And what I did it. Uh, I wasn't unhappy that I was being paid to read the book. Uh, and the other thing that struck me is that Glencoe is a very well-educated, literate, affluent community. And here is the greatest novel ever written, and the library's lone copy was on the shelf every day when I went to read it. And from that experience, I began to reflect on um, the same kinds of issues that, uh, that Greg and Rick have talked about, which is, uh, you know, if a tree fa falls in the forest, is there sound? And if a writer writes without an audience, is it, is it a book? <coughs> and for me, the next big revelation came many years later in the course of my journey when I was sitting in a criminal courtroom in uh, Chicago, having become a young prosecutor. And I looked around and I realized not only was I um, sitting there slack-jawed listening to um, the account of the star witness in that case about how did something evil happen. But the courtroom was full of people, all of them, every bit as intent. And at that point I realized that not only did crime fascinate me, but that it fascinated many other people. And for me at least it was the, the sort of King's Highway uh, to the issues that I wanted to write about. So, uh, you know, I, I understand the ghettoization of, of genre fiction, and I don't regard it as completely irrational. If you talk about the mystery, uh, the mystery is um, erected on the premise that uh, there will be an answer to the question of who done it and why. And uh, to some extent, uh, all fiction, all fiction has to answer the question of why people behave the way they do. But there's an artificial constraint uh, that exists in the mystery to explain um, and also to usually not just explain but to surprise. Uh, and there's an academic argument that there's a lack of verisimilitude of in that and that uh, therefore the mystery, uh, for example, is a lesser form. Um, and, you know, I, it's like I do what I do. And uh, I look at people like Graham Greene and Le Carre, writers of suspense, who I think of as icons. And uh, they're not the only writers I admire, uh, but I think that, um, you know, to, to, to prejudge is unfortunate, but as I made the point uh, this morning, there are plenty of readers who will only gravitate to that uh, shelf in the bookstore, to the extent people still go to bookstores, that's marked crime. So there, there are advantages to it as well. Great. Yes, Scott great. brought up something important about genre fiction. If you just look at the traditional constrained forms, where like Agatha Christie or something, where there's a disturbance to the pristine order and then it's resolved and somehow it's comforting, the whole experience is comforting for readers. That's not what I think we're talking about in genre fiction. I mean, look at Scott in Presumed Innocent. When you get to the end of that book and he says there is justice and there is punishment, it's not a comforting thing. You finish it and you feel like, oh, everything's restored wonderfully. You're looking at the actual costs of human life and that... It's great that as long as you stretch the genre, you can deal with serious things, you know? Well said. Well, first of all, I'm relieved that Scott did not write uh, uh, Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> I, I really like Presumed <laughs> quite a lot. I never would have finished the other two books. Uh, so I think it's they, they really- They're not hearing you. I, I, think, I, I think it's really important to be accessible. Um, uh, the, I, I guess the, the difficulty I always had with with classification uh, is you could classify Hamlet as a family drama if you wanted to. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you know the, the question is what, what are the elements you're trying to bring? I mean, uh, one of my unfortunate experiences, and it happened to me not infrequently, particularly with women, uh, saying uh, basically, gee, I was compelled to read one of your books because I met you. I never would have otherwise. 
you're not nearly as dumb as I would have taken you for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you, and, and you write about actual relationships. Uh, and that was sort of, that's, sort of the, that's the ambivalence. On the one hand, you have a built-in receptive audience for what you are uh, categorized as by publishers as much as anything. Uh, but you also exclude people. And my, my target audience was anyone who ever read a book. <laughs> uh, and so anything that impeded me from reaching those folks, I, I kind of resented. But, but that said, I think it is very important to say, again, that there are certain elements uh, of what you would call suspense fiction, which are infinitely useful in carrying all sorts of other elements and values in a book. I never, ever, ever wanted somebody to be bored or indifferent to what happened next. Greg, I would love you to talk about, I'd like us all to talk about process. Um, and so if you would talk a little bit about the, uh, the guys in the basement. Okay, okay. I'll, this I'll is do one this of the quickly. most, I think, charming things. As that I came said out yesterday, and I always get in trouble with my publisher, I go most of the year lying to my publishers. I've always done that. I don't write. I coach my kids Little League. I play music, whatever I'm doing. And the story's working itself out inside in a Jungian way, really, without ever writing a word. But Stephen King, Scott and my bandmate, put it best when he said, all writers' minds are like a house, and the subconscious is the basement of the house. And down in the basement are a bunch of crates that are unlabeled. And the stupidest thing you can do as a writer is try to go down in that basement and sort out the crates <laughs> because there's already a crew down there working on the crates. <laughs> and your job is to stay the hell out of the way. And I was so relieved when I heard that. I read it in Steve's book on writing because that had always been my system. Just stay out of the way. The story's happening. And then for me, it's like, and I say this, my wife's a week from delivery right now, but I'm going to use a pregnancy motive, uh, motif here. It's like the story reaches a point, and I have like four months left, as I do now on a deadline, and it's like a pregnant woman when her water breaks. Man, that story's coming. I run for the lazy boy with my hospital table and my tabs and my granola bars, and I start working 12 hours a day, and at the end, I'm staying up 24 and even 36 hours at a time. And it's like I'm taking dictation. I, I swear, that's, that's my system. I don't recommend it. You won't live long. You, you'll have car wrecks and lose your leg. You, it's, 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 a, it's like a rock and roll version of writing, but it works for me. So that's the process. It's uh, much like my process, and I didn't have the wisdom of it, but I get to the end, and I can spend 10 days just as many hours a day without leaving yeah. the machine. Now, Rick, I know, has a very different process when you were writing fiction. Yeah, Rick I have is a, in the most intense outliner. Yeah, I, I have the soulful approach of a, a, a Kremlin bureaucrat. I basically plan the thing <laughs> uh, very carefully. Uh, now, I, I will say that in, in line with Greg, I used to not work every summer on the ground that your, your subconscious should be unmolested uh, for at least for a while. Uh, but I never trusted those guys in the basement. I weren't really sure they were there. <laughs> um, um, so I would start out by knowing how the story ended. I would think through the general story. And, and the reason was not simply so the narrative would make sense, but also it would make psychological sense so that people behaved in a way that was consistent with their character. Even if it was surprising, you could see, see how that happened. So I always thought the end needed to resonate back to the beginning both in terms of the narrative and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the behavior of the characters. The other thing that I did is I got increasingly driven to research. I've never believed this stuff, write what you know, because I would write about some like white guy forever. <laughs> uh, um, I, when I wrote my novel about the Israeli-Palestinian dilemma, I went to Israel, I went to the West Bank, I interviewed a hundred people. I, I read a lot. A lot of that information was non-native to me. There was no way to retain it without taking a lot of notes uh, and then trying to figure out how to integrate that in the story. And, so and a lot of your novels have ended up being heavily researched. Yeah, yeah. So I had, um, uh, I had well, maybe a hundred files from scene to scene, from beginning to end, organized into sections, and I had notes for what was going to be in that scene. I had my research notes keyed to what I was going to write about. So I showed up every day like the Kremlin bureaucrat, and I knew what I had to do. Now, some days were better than other days, but I never, um, 
didn't show up for work. I never didn't write something. And some days when I thought I was wonderful, I'd look at the end of the day and it looked like it was translated from, from the Bulgarian, just awful. Um, <laughs> other days I thought I was just being a pro and I looked at it, it was pretty good. So the important thing to me was to show up and do the work uh, or there would be just a, a blank page. So. Uh, unlike Greg, I didn't have a staff. I was thrown back on my poor, humble resources, so I, I, I did with that uh, the best I could. <laughs> and Scott? Well, I'm uh, sort of somewhere between the two. One of the remarks I made yesterday is one of, what, probably the, the greatest joy of my professional life has been being able to hang around with other writers. And, because I still think of writers as the, the real rock stars to me. And what I've learned over the years to the extent, especially with the band, to the extent that Dave Barry uh, can be eluded and we can talk a little shop, uh, something that Dave ardently discourages, um, I've, I've learned everybody has a different process. So uh, my process uh, is somewhere, as I said, between Rick and Greg, and I really agree with Steve's observation about uh, the, the, the guys in the basement. But you know, every now and then they wander up to the first floor. <laughs> and uh, they're like, you know, does anybody know where Poughkeepsie is? <laughs> and uh, and I, I like in the early stages to sort of take those gleanings and write them down. And um, you know, I, I, I didn't get into this yesterday when Greg and I were talking, but you know, I'd had a thought in the morning about what does it mean to be a, uh, a criminal defense lawyer who spent m your whole life as a voyeur um, watching uh, bad things happen and then dealing with the realities of what occurred and what didn't occur. And, uh, you know, I dashed down a paragraph about what, it, what it's like to live in that kind of voyeuristic milieu. Will it find its way into the next novel? I'd say there's a 70% chance that it will. But I, I like to collect those kinds of impressions uh, as I go along, and I find that's the way the story builds. And then I can court a kind of streamline uh, and begin to put things in sequence and ask, myself the question, which I don't put too much weight on, which is, how does this story end? Um, and uh, I, I figure sooner or later that will suggest itself to me. But I, I, my, my, I regard my process. So the advantage of what Greg does is that um, he puts himself under so much pressure <laughs> that he gets the book done. Uh, whereas the way I do it, I you know, I'm, wander I'm wandering around and writing stuff and probably, you know, overall 30% of what I write in that first year uh, finds its way in any rough form into the book I finally write. So it's not terribly efficient to do it the you way know, I You know, I just realized the problem. I'm haunted by Calvinism. If I threw away <laughs> 300 pages, I'd feel like I'd failed morally. Uh, <laughs> Do you always find, Scott, the, the impressions that you've written? I do that a lot, and then I write them on scraps of paper when I meet interesting people, or, and then I find them after the book is finished sometimes. I, I rarely go back and read what was committed to paper, and uh, I have to say that when people say, well, what's the interaction between being a novelist and being a lawyer? Uh, that was one of the things that I learned when I started practicing law. Because when a judge tells you that it's a fi you're allowed 15 pages for your memorandum, he or she does not mean 17 and a half. Right. <laughs> and you have got to cut and pare, and it doesn't matter how deathless you think your words are, uh, and you've got to impose that kind of discipline on yourself. And, uh, you know, my agent is always, she's, she has constantly comforted me with the fairy tale, oh, you'll put it in the next book, uh, <laughs> which is not true. This is yeah. not true. I don't even go back and read it. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I sometimes think, wow, that it would really be fun to sort of 
write a kind of commonplace book which is made up mm -hmm. of excerpts that I never published. I keep that <laughs> journal. I keep a commonplace journal and I have a lot of what if moments. What if I had found that in time to put it in the fourth book, but I didn't. Can we talk ab about editors for a minute? Rick, I know from our many discussions what uh, one editor in particular meant to you uh, in your novelistic years. You well, know, first of all, editors are, are almost always a help and sometimes a terrific help. And I think the difference between uh, somebody making it in our business, somebody not making it, is to a great degree your willingness to accept advice and recognize good advice. I knew lots of people that were uh, writers of 8% good enough first drafts. Instead of taking the rest of the way, they'd just pitch it, write another 8% good enough first draft. So, I mean, the concept of editing is terribly important. Now, my best editor ever uh, had this process. I mean, I'd write, you know, 700 pretty complicated pages with a pretty complicated architecture. And he would look at the whole, first of all, and he, I'd go back to New York, I'd sit in his office, and we'd, we would leaf through the thing page by page, talking not about words, but about structure, how this thing worked as a narrative. Because he said he couldn't do one thing and then, you know, like obsess over words. And once we got the structure right, then he'd do the line editing. And it wasn't, um, you know, severe. I tried to save him some trouble by writing well in the first place. But <laughs> it was not, <laughs> you know, it, it was not insignificant. And it was a wonderful process because, you know, I'm very particular and all writers should be about language, but there's also the business of architecture and structure. And what scene needs more, what scene needs less, what doesn't need to be there, uh, what needs to be explained better. And no matter how good you think you are, no matter how much second sight you think you have, a really good editor is valuable to invaluable. And in this day and age, with publishing having changed so much, which we may talk about, uh, many young writers don't have editors. There are they're just not uh, being paid for by publishers uh, or they're spread too thin. So for me, it's a great luxury. Having grown up reading the Max Perkins correspondence with mm -hmm. Hemingway and Fitzgerald and wanting, longing for that kind of relationship when I grew up and wrote books, uh, it really doesn't exist anymore. So Scott, I think you talked yesterday about sometimes having a six to eight month process after you've turned in a manuscript yeah, with yeah, an editor, always. which I don't, it's not something I do, but would you always. tell us? Um, yeah, I have to say that, you know, you're looking at three, really four people who have the advantage of honestly referring to themselves as best-selling novelists. And um, people think, I mean, they're, they're, you get an audience, you get a bigger paycheck, but in today's publishing world, one of the things you also get that many writers no longer do is an actual editor, somebody who sits down and tries to help you write um, to make better the book that's there and to help you write the book that she or he thinks you intended to write. And uh, in terms of my novels, I've worked with two editors. Uh, first, John Galassi, who's now the publisher at Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux, and a dear, dear friend uh, to this day. And early on, Jonathan and I had, you know, a, a, almost a mystical relationship. And we would sit usually in a hotel room in New York and turn, John would turn every page of the manuscript. And he would have his own notes, his own sort of free association and impression. Sometimes he was questioning a word, sometimes he questioned a whole paragraph. Uh, sometimes that led us into a discussion of an arc in the book. Sometimes we'd both sit there and go, oh, you know, I, I like that. Do you like that? And yeah, I like that <laughs> a lot. So, um, it, and it was wonderful. And of course, it's, uh, you know, the problem, of course, is that people recognize Jonathan's talent and put him in charge of the publishing house. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was much, much harder for for him to do that, and uh, then worked with Deb Futter at Grand Central, and Deb was a much different kind of editor, uh, and she was sort of terrier-like in the sense that she figured out what the problem was in the book, and then um, told me to solve it, and, uh, <laughs> and, when, and if I solved it, that was okay, 
But if I didn't solve it, it wasn't okay. And, you know, she would toss it back, as it were, and say, well, here's what I'm thinking, and here's why what you've done, uh, basically. And she was, of course, kind and sympathetic, but she was really saying, it's not good enough. Uh, and, uh, and she would keep, she would just keep doing that till we were both satisfied with the book. Uh, they are, I think of both of them as really great editors. Different I'm lucky to have them. Yes, absolutely. And Greg, do you have a different? <laughs> this is going to sound arrogant, but if I wanted another opinion, I'd be writing for Hollywood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, let me be in all seriousness. I've had good editing is just a function. It doesn't matter who does it in my mind. The reason I, I haven't had real close relationships with my editors is because I told you how I write, and I, I'm a, I was a musician, not a lawyer, before I did this. And to me, language is musical. And I realized early on that editors could look at two sentences, and I could certainly make a sentence more economical and efficient, but it wasn't nearly as good a sentence as the thing I had done. And I realized the editor did not even hear the rhythm of the sentence, did not read it aloud, did not understand. And I, I, if somebody can't see that, I can't work with them. Now, I've had three agents in my life, two served that sort of function when I wanted it, and that's the kind of nice relationship to have. My more typical relations with a publisher would be like when I was at Putnam and I was at a lunch with Phyllis Grand and I had turned in a book and she goes, the book is great, I love it, it's fantastic, Greg, just needs a little work. And I was, well, what does it need? She goes, you need to cut 50,000 words. <laughs> and, and I typically write really long books and, and I said, well, which 50,000, Phyllis? She goes, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, to finish though, in all seriousness, I'm with a writer's house now, and uh, it's run by Simon Lipscar, who's an agent. When I turned in volume three of my trilogy, which the trilogy taken in total is about 2,300 pages and took eight years of my life, and Simon read the last book, and he called, and he said, listen, man, I've never given you an editorial suggestion in my life, but here's what I'm telling you. I don't think you got where you wanted to go right at the end of this thing. I don't have any suggestions. I don't know exactly where it fell short, but why don't you think about it? And I was so pissed off when I hung up the phone. And I, but within 12 hours, by the time I was awake the next morning, it was like, by God, he is right. And I completely altered the outcome of the trial, the resolution of the novel, all of it. Because Simon Lipscar had the genius to just take one look and just go, nah, something's wrong. You know, so I'm not saying I don't take advice. I will, but if you want to give me advice, you better know that book damn well as good as I do, you know where it came <laughs> from. You know, okay. I can't even imagine not having the editorial exchange and trust, discarding some of it, but finding some of it valuable. So, kudos to you for for going that way. Now, you said the magic word that a lot of people in the last day have asked me if we're going to talk about, which is, you said it, Hollywood. So, um, and I know there was some kind of program about books, good books that made good movies or not. I happen to think, loving the novel Presumed Innocent as I do, that um, that was an awfully good movie as well. I don't know how the author feels, but would you talk about your Hollywood experience? Well, my, my Hollywood experiences are many, and... Um, you know, uh, Linda, of, of course, as some of you know, has a little bit of a stake in <laughs> Presumed Innocent because she was also a technical consultant on the movie. And, for free. For free. And, and, <laughs> and uh, a, f a friend of the wonderful Alan Pakula who directed and really wrote, wrote the movie. And I, I was very pleased with the movie. Um, you know, um, it, the reality, of course, is that the first thing I saw in Presumed Innocent was uh, a trailer. And it was one of those scenes where Alan had been particularly careful and his uh, assistant director, Celia Costas, and he asking me how I saw this and the sets were just perfect. And it was one of those moments in the, in the movie where the dialogue was taken straight from the novel and uh, Joe Grafasi and uh, Harrison Ford looked very much like the characters that I had imagined and they were speaking the lines exactly as I had heard them in my own head 
and still a voice screamed out inside me, wait, wait, the camera's on the wrong side of the room. <laughs> and it's, it's never going to be exactly what the novelist envisioned, and you must let go of it. And, uh, you know, it's the, it really is the, the pathway to madness to try to expect uh, another artist and another team of artists to uh, coordinate what they are doing to your own vision. And, uh, you know, in some ways the, the best piece of advice ever given to novelists is Ernest Hemingway's when he said, uh, take your book to the California-Nevada border, uh, toss it over, grab the check, and run like hell in the <laughs> other direction. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great thing. But then you went on, you had an, a second feature film. Yeah, I've, right? had, I've had lots of adventures in Hollywood, and I've had books sold to become movies that the movies have never been made, that far more often. I've had TV miniseries, TV movies, uh, you know, a pilot was filmed based on one of my novels. I've ended up in the last few years doing a little bit of screenwriting myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I have... I have respect for what goes on there, but as I often tell people, there is a reason I have stayed in Chicago and haven't moved to Hollywood. It's an uh, enticing, overwhelming, um, seductive environment, and uh, I like being a novelist. That's key. Rick, um, Rick too. Isn't well, I, Scott and I once did uh, uh, an event somewhat like this, and I was asked about movie deals, and I said, movie deals are like sperm. Many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, <laughs> so, um, a, a line, uh, by the way, <laughs> that I repeat <laughs> with attribution <laughs> constantly. Uh, so, but you know, yes, Hollywood is full of tragedies. I was very pleased to, um, uh, relatively recently, you know, you know, nine, 10 months ago, uh, option one of my books to a, a, a very uh, eminent, uh, uh, producer, uh, Harvey Weinstein. Um, <laughs> um, and all I can say is me too. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, true, true. Um, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm with Scott. I've had uh, a couple of films uh, made one better than the other. I had, uh, I've had other films uh, uh, not made, and when I read the screen treatment, I was actually quite relieved. Um, but I think the thing to remember is what Scott says. It's their art form. It's not your art form. Your art form is, is, is the book, and they can't do a damn thing to that. That's the thing you've done. The other thing is what they do and pay to do with your idea, uh, for better or worse. And if you don't have the detachment uh, to realize that your book is not wholly written in Hollywood, then you have no busy business dealing with those folks because they'll just make you absolutely crazy. So uh, bottom line, uh, I was always happy uh, to be engaged in the process at a distance. When I saw something made of mine that I thought was successful, I was very pleased to see it take this different form. But I didn't have any big emotional stake in it. And I think that way lies sanity. Greg, I experience? can't top their, their one-liners <laughs> here. Uh, I, don't, I don't write the kind of book that lends itself well to Hollywood. I write very long, internalized books. They made a movie out of my shortest book ever. That gives you how Hollywood works. And it was like a master class in how to screw up a novel is what it ended up being. And I saw most of it firsthand. and got a lifetime of stories you can only tell in adult company. <laughs> um, af after that, they offered me a bunch of book doctor, script doctor work where they pay you astonishing amounts of money to fix movies that are in trouble. I said no 12 times in a row because the essence of being a, a script doctor, which a lot of well-known novelists do, they pay you a whole lot of money, you don't get any credit, and you get faxes every day from 10 people giving you suggestions. And that's, you know, for me, that I just can't handle that. Now, with my trilogy, I'll end on this. I had the dream situation. When the thing finally came out, I started getting called on the road on book tour from A-list Hollywood actors. There was a bidding war, and all the big cable 
I won't say any names, but all the big cable things were bidding on it. And I wound up with a deal that just floored me, you know. It was a, like, Game of Thrones kind of deal, you know, budget, <laughs> that level of budget, and big Hollywood actor and stuff. And in the end, it died because the big actor in it finally got cold feet and wasn't ready to make his transition to TV. But here's what worries me about, about Hollywood. In the process, a whole lot of stuff got done before that happened, and it died, and that was, these are about civil rights murders. They're fictionalized, but it was about the truth. And the first thing they did was ask me if they could change one of the main characters, a middle-aged white reporter from Faraday, Louisiana, who was based on a friend of mine who was just a hero. Who sp he, he almost, he lost the Pulitzer to the spotlight people from Boston. And this is a tiny little guy who makes no money and is just a, a martyr. And they said, can we change that guy and make him black? And I said, well, you know, let me call him, but this, this bothers me. And here's why it bothered me. In real life, I live in Mississippi. In real life, these crimes are not being exposed by young, idealistic black guys. They're being exposed by middle-aged white guys for whatever reason, okay? And... The, the killer of Medgar Evers, or the, the cases that my books are about, those are middle-aged white guys busting their tail to break these stories because they feel it's the right thing to do. But that doesn't fit the pre-existing narrative they want in L.A., so, well, let's make him a black guy. So that really bugs me. I agree with Scott. you got to let go of things. But on the other hand, look, I, I'm writing about the truth here. So let's don't twist the truth to fit some pre-existing narrative about the way you wish things were. Politically, okay? Anyway. In our remaining time, I'm going to ask you each, starting with Rick, would you tell us what you're working on now and uh, in your writing and um, what you like about the writer's life? Well, I, first of all, I like uh, uh, what both Greg and Scott have alluded to. We're not employees. We're self-employed, and it's the nicest kind of self-employment there can be because the first person you have to answer to is you. Um, and nobody tells you what to write. They may tell you they're not happy with what you've written, but you're not, you're not working from a, a cookie cutter, unlike screenwriting where you have some guy calling you before he's fired and the next guy calls you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, so but, but, but right now, I, I, I wrote my last line of fiction in, the, uh, I think, Halloween 2012. Uh, and since then, after a couple of years painting badly, um, I, I, I have been dedicated myself to what for me is a whole other career, which is writing seriously about American politics and geopolitics, international affairs uh, as well. And that's very absorbing. I mean, to me, there's a real moral urgency to what's going on in this country now. Um, and it needs writing about. And such is the turn of events that one has to try to find an eye for what is really important as opposed to the daily and the quotidian or the outrageous. Uh, and so for me, it's been a, a great new challenge. I have, a, in addition to the lovely folks like these guys, I have a great new uh, peer group of people who are in the business of writing columns. I'm engaged in, in activities around it. So for me, it's been wonderful to get back to what I think I do the best, but in a, in a, in a very different form. So that's been a privilege. And Greg? What? what what you're working on and Whoa, what you uh, God I, I don't want to give any spoilers. I'm working on things, multiple things right now. I don't want to talk about any of the Hollywood things. Some I'm actually working with a guy from the Mississippi Delta. Here's the three word pitch. I sound so arrogant and literary, right? Here's the pitch: Jaws with hogs. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's almost more hogs in Texas than people. That's all I'll leave you with. Okay? And Wild if you hogs. And if you sign up for the Rancho Mirage Mississippi River trip, you'll meet Greg, and he will tell you more about it. <laughs> and Scott, tell us. Well, I, you know, my dream was to be a novelist, and all I, all I can say is I dreamt well. Uh, there is, it, it is just an incredibly great life. Especially, of course, when the work is going well. And, uh, you know, as I often say to Adrian, uh, okay, I'll see you around lunchtime. I'm going upstairs to play with my imaginary friends. <laughs> and um, it's perfect. It, it really is um, rewarding in all senses, including 
the most important one, of feeling that you are using everything you've got as a human being uh, to bring something to the page. And uh, I regard myself as a blessed human being. And uh, Can I say something about these two guys? Yes. Yeah. Quick. Scott, uh, what... what Everywhere I go, I say, they say, what's Scott like? You play in a band with him. I say, he's a gentleman and a scholar. He's what you think he would be. But going back to Anatomy of a Murder, which was the only antecedent probably for what Scott did, and then Scott moved the earth and created a genre, really, with Presumed Innocent, which is still the best of the lot, despite an army of lawyers coming in his wake. And, and we know the genre is flooded, but then I remember the day I opened Degree of Guilt, in red, and I thought, okay, here's another one who can write right here, for real, you know? Because most couldn't who, who did it. And these guys, creme de la creme. So I'm proud to be sitting up here with these guys. Really <laughs> honored. Back, back at you. Okay. And, and, and I was going to say that too, but <laughs> thank you, Greg, for saying that. And to all three of you, it really is, uh, it really is the Hall of Famers, you. and you're great. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you for being here. <laughs>